With the exception of skin cancer, colorectal cancer is the third most common cancer diagnosed among both men and women in the United States. Our guest on this week's Health Talk, a specialist in oncology and hematology, will tell you what you could do to help reduce your chances of dying from this all too common malignancy. She'll also discuss recent advances in the diagnosis and treatment of colorectal cancer. This is an important show for both men and women. So please stay tuned, Health Talk is up next. Hello, I'm Dr. Eric Mazur. Today our topic is an important one, colorectal cancer. Joining me to discuss this very important topic is Dr. Nicole Carew. She's a hematologist and oncologist with the Whittingham Cancer Center here in Norwalk Hospital. Welcome to Health Talk, Nicole. It's so good to have you. So good to have you in the community, and it's good to have you here at Norwalk Hospital. Thank you for having me. So you are a, an expert on oncology. I'm, as many, any regular viewer of the show knows, I'm a worn out, a feet oncologist. <laughs> and I am just amazed at some of the changes that are happening with cancer therapies across the board. What's, what's new in colorectal cancer? So colorectal cancer, we actually have recently started using immunotherapy for. Not everybody qualifies for immunotherapy, but there are certain indications. And then there are also certain indications for targeted therapy. So immunotherapy is a little bit different from standard chemotherapy in that chemotherapy attacks all of the body cells that are rapidly dividing, so you get a lot of side effects like hair loss, rash, nausea, vomiting. Immunotherapy is better tolerated because it really makes your own immune system able to fight the cancer cells. Now, again, back in my old, the old days, people used to think of immunotherapy, at least we used to talk about it, as grinding up the cancer and giving it back to the patient <laughs> the, as an injection. This is much more sophisticated now, I know. Uh, to tell us, you know, I, well, maybe you can say a little bit about how cancers you have been hiding from the immune system and how some of these new drugs un unmask them. Sure, so the cancer cells actually have their own ability to produce certain proteins that make them invisible to our own immune system. And that's really how they grow out of control and spread to other parts of the body. You know, everybody probably gets a cancer cell or, you know, we don't even know how many, maybe even hundreds over their lifetime. But for most people, their immune system is able to see the cancer and fight it off. In these circumstances, they develop these specialized proteins that sort of surround it and hide it from the body's immune system, and that's why they're able to populate and spread. But the immunotherapy can help to unmask those proteins and make the tumors more visible to the body's immune system. So tell us a little bit about uh, when do you start to think about some of these advanced treatments? Are these all for patients with advanced disease? I know for, uh, uh, I guess, uh, we used to give chemotherapy for adjuvant to after patients had been surgically, had their t disease surgically removed, we would give a course of chemotherapy to sort of mop up any residual cells that might be in the body. Uh, tell us about, you know, what, are we still staging colon cancer the same way? We, sure. What, what's the approach today? Sure, so still, you know, the lower stages, stages one, two, and even stage three surgery is sort of the first And that line. sort of means it's all localized to one area of the colon or maybe a colon and a lymph node. Yes, In exactly. the regional lymph node. Yeah, but no spread to the distant sites, like no, no liver disease, no lung disease. So we're still taking yes. that out surgically? Still taking it out surgically. And then as far as adjuvant therapy goes, we still are using chemotherapy. So we use chemotherapy for stage three disease, which has lymph node involvement and a, a larger size tumor, typically. Um, but for stage two, there are some high risk features that we look at where some of those patients now may qualify for adjuvant chemotherapy, meaning after they've taken it out surgically, they get a little chemotherapy to prevent. Are, are people using minimally invasive surgery or laparoscopic surgery now? Yeah. Uh, is, is that the rule rather than the exception? I would say most people are having so laparoscopic. So it's a, yes. it's a much less invasive process for the patient to have this, their cancers removed. Absolutely. Very small scar incision, just a couple of inches. So, so that sounds like the earlier cancers are treated not too differently now than they were several years ago. How about screening? I've also heard that there have been some changes in the recommendations for screening. Absolutely, that actually just changed recently. So now everybody who's at average risk of getting colon cancer, so nobody who has a family history of cancer and nobody who has underlying inflammatory bowel disease, but just your regular healthy individual should be screened at age 45, which just recently changed from age 50, which was the previous recommendation. And uh, screening consists of, what's the recommended, recommended screening right now? 
Our preferred method is still the colonoscopy. So if you have a good clean colonoscopy with nothing, we would say every 10 years. And then if you had some polyps, they would change the interval to somewhere between two and five years, depending what was found. Um, and that's still the best because we are able to actually look in the colon, find the cancer, and remove it in the one procedure. And one of the things that uh, I know we've understood over the past 20 years or so, maybe 30, is that most colon cancers start as polyps non-malignant polyps, and then they develop over time into the colon cancers. So the whole idea behind screening is if you can find the polyp and take it out, it's not going to evolve into a cancer. So it's, it's a very effective, very effective screening tool. Uh, what, you know what percentage of the population, half, to, half the people are getting properly screened now? You know, I actually couldn't tell you that answer. I know that there's a big gap. Uh, that there are a lot of people that aren't being screened who should be screened. And, and some of it is because patients don't want to get the colonoscopy. Other is, you know, potentially not knowing that they should be screened, not following regularly with a primary care doctor. So it is really important that everyone follows with their primary care doctor. And if they don't want to go for the colonoscopy, to ask about other methods of screening, such as now we have something called the FIT test, which is one of those stool studies that you can actually do at home. And they recommend that you do that every three years if mm -hmm. yours is normal. Um, but the, you know, kind of downside to that is if you do find something, you still do have to go for the colonoscopy. Yeah, well, these are, but it's real. this is a cancer which hopefully no one should be, I shouldn't say nobody, but it should be rare that people die from it because screening, catching it early as possible, it works, and uh, we shouldn't overlook the opportunity. As someone, I've kept up with my colonoscopies. It's literally a nuisance, but it's no worse than a nuisance. And sure. that people shouldn't be afraid of it. But so 45, let's talk just a couple seconds before we move on to advanced disease, is uh, patients who uh, are at higher risk. How do you know if you're at higher risk than the average healthy person? Sure, so if you have a family member who's been diagnosed with colon cancer, particularly your parents or a sibling, even your grandparents, um, you should still let your doctors know if you have cousins and aunts, but that's a little bit less relevant. But people who have parents and siblings who've been diagnosed with colon cancer, particularly at a younger age, they actually need to be screened 10 years earlier than when their family member was diagnosed. So that means if my brother had can uh, colon cancer diagnosed at 42, I should start my colonoscopies at 32. 32, exactly. It's too late for me now to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this is important. I think a lot of people miss that opportunity. And uh, there are lots of uh, familial syndromes mm -hmm. of colon cancer, but you don't even have to have one of those. That you exactly, know yeah. So this is not an opportunity that should be missed. And it's, uh, it's, it's, I've lost friends to colon cancer. It's really not a way that people should People shouldn't die of that anymore. And unfortunately, we're seeing it in, in younger patients more, and I think that's why the recommendation has changed, because there are some things that you know people are doing in their day-to-day -day life that can affect their risk. So being obese, not exercising, eating a poor diet that's filled with processed foods, particularly processed meats like hot dogs, sausages, things that have nitrites, and also red meats, those are found to have increased. Risk. It's amazing how this theme seems to follow every specialty in here. Whenever we talk about exercise more, eat less, eat less, fewer calories, and eat better <laughs> foods, eat more vegetables, eat more colorful vegetables, eat less meat. It, and it seems to be good for almost everything. And yet it's, it's, a, it's a problem in our society, isn't it? And I, I'm as guilty as anyone at, at, at having a rotten diet. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's, a very, it's a very hard thing to do. And yet some people, you really should incorporate that into your regular life. Yeah, it is a big help in this disease in particular. So, so let's talk, so someone is, has a diagnosis of colon cancer. Uh, what, what is, other than the screening recommendations, tell us a little bit more about the, the newer approaches to therapy or things that, that uh, we're, we're, we're going to see the, the, ne the next set of advances. Well, the advances really are in the advanced disease setting. So if somebody who has colon cancer that's spread to their liver or to their lungs, these are patients who we would check for certain proteins for on their tumor that may qualify them for immunotherapy or other targeted therapies. So there are also other mutations that we look for that qualify people occasionally for a pill medication or an additional IV medication that's not considered to be chemotherapy. So these are, are driver mutations. Do you want to say a little thing about, I mean, this is, again, really where the oncology is just, been revolutionized. For my career, most of the, the work going on where people were studying the tumors and beginning to understand some of these uh, genetic, they, they're not inherited genetic mutations, they're acquired genes that are inappropriately activated, but it hadn't translated into therapy. It was really still just understanding the disease. Now we're seeing a flood of drugs that are targeting these 
these uh, acquired mutations. So maybe you could talk about a few of them. Yeah, you know, so I, I know that some of it may be a little detailed, but it's really sort of amazing that we now understand at a molecular level what is causing this cell to become cancerous and we can turn off the switches. Right. So there's a lot of different pathways that, you know, tumor cells use to evade the immune system and replicate rapidly and spread. And so some of these are the RAS pathways, the BRAF, which is connected to that. Um, and so if you have a mutation, for example, in BRAF, that's really what's driving the cancer cells to divide and to spread. And these are really usually pretty aggressive tumors. So although- so How do you find out, how to, as a doctor, what do you do with the tumor to find out if it's a, a RAS positive tumor or a RAS is driving that tumor? So it's actually the pathologist that does this. So we just request it from the pathologist and depending on what specifically we're requesting, they're either doing stains on the tumor tissue that they've obtained either through the biopsy or through surgery, whichever avenue we've made the diagnosis from. Um, and then also some of these are actual DNA tests and RNA tests, so they're sending them to different labs to actually look at the composition of the DNA of the tumor. So w when someone has localized disease. Do you do this kind of analysis at that point ever in anticipation of possibly having advanced disease? Or do you re-biopsy the tissue when it, if it recurs and, and reevaluate it on that new tissue? So that's a great question. We never do this on a stage one patient, um, probably not on a stage two, except for one that's the mismatch repair proteins, which is the one where you may actually qualify for immunotherapy if you had stage four disease. And part of the reason that we do that on the stage two patients is those patients actually tend to do better. So if they are deficient in the mismatch repair proteins, they tend to have a better prognosis, and that's somebody who, if it, they were stage two, we would not recommend adjuvant mm -hmm. treatment for. Um, other mutations, though, we don't tend to do at the early stage. We wait until they're at a more advanced stage, probably partially because we hope that they don't get to that right. stage, and also because we, we do want to repeat a biopsy at that point. Depending how many years later, they may have other mutations that we can find, and also we want to prove that this is actually their colon cancer that has spread. So th this is really a new generation or a new concept of individualized medicine. Uh, and the whole concept, concept of tumor of cancers is changing in the sense that, again, uh, 20 years ago, colon cancer was colon cancer. Uh, now we understand that, or, or other lung cancer, that, that there are very specific genetic variants that lead to different therapies. Maybe you could say a, a little bit about how we view these cancers as how different one that can be from one patient to another. Well, I think that it's most notable in lung cancer, but in colon cancer, you know, somebody who has a BRAF mutated cancer, we think of as being a more aggressive tumor, and we really want to monitor that patient a little bit more closely, which may mean do, definitely doing increased um, imaging, CT scans, and monitoring them closely for symptoms, checking for anemia on their basic labs, and having very close follow-up with that patient. So this is being based on a molecular profiling of their tumor earlier on that tells you that they are a, 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 a RAS positive uh, colon cancer. And, and maybe you could also say a, a few words about the immunotherapy. I know you, you said that you were unmasking it. Uh, so your own immune system, is, is that killing the, cell, the cancer cells? That's really what we're aiming to do here, yeah. We're really trying to essentially get those tumors out from, from their hidden shield, so to speak, from those proteins and making it so that the immune system can see them and actually attack it on its own. And it's, it's really, again, with that's sort of the silver bullet we all sort of wished for in oncology is that the immune system is doing that for us. Yes. Exactly. It's really, fa this is an, a, an area which is changing so fast. If we have you on a year from now, I'm sure it'll be different then. And uh, it's a very exciting time for cancer therapy. Now, I don't think people realize how much, how many advances are being made so quickly right now. So that's all we have time for. I'm so sorry. Uh, I'd like to thank our guest, Dr. Nicole Carew, for joining us on Health Talk today. And thank you for watching. Remember to send us your questions and comments to healthtalk at nuvancehealth.org. We'll see you next time. Coronavirus isn't over. We still have to slow the spread and do our part. Let's wear face masks in public. Stay six feet or more from others. Follow state and local guidelines. Wash our hands frequently and stay home when we feel safe. For ourselves, for our loved ones, for our future. Let's move forward together. Learn more at coronavirus.gov. 145 over 92. 
180 over 111. 182 over 100. And I had a heart attack and a cardiac arrest and then a stroke. Your blood pressure numbers could change your life. A lot of people don't understand, including myself, I didn't, now I do, uh, the impact of having a stroke. My memory is shot. When I woke up, I couldn't speak. If I would have followed a treatment plan, I would not be in this situation. It's a tough journey. Lowering your high blood pressure could save you from a heart attack or stroke. If you've stopped your treatment plan, restart it, or talk to your doctor about creating one that works better for you. Start taking the right steps at manageyourbp.org. It's a new life, but I'm going to make it better. I'm coming back. Check your blood pressure. The last 10 to 15 years have seen really remarkable advances in the early diagnosis and treatment of lung cancer. So what are these modern approaches to the diagnosis and treatment? And aside from not smoking, how can you further reduce your lung cancer risk? Our guest on this week's Health Talk, who specializes in the treatment of cancer patients, will cover these points and more on today's Health Talk. So stay tuned, we're coming up next. Hello, I'm Dr. Eric Mazur. Today we're going to discuss lung cancer, from prevention to advances in treatment. Our guest is Dr. Nicole Carew. She's a hematologist and oncologist with the Whittingham Cancer Center at Norwalk Hospital. Welcome to Health Talk, Nicole. It's so good to have you. I'm really excited to talk about this because there's so much that's happening in lung cancer. Again, in my era, there was small cell lung cancer, which would respond to chemotherapy and everything else, which didn't. Mm -hmm. And there was not a lot we could do. And all of a sudden, we now have screening approaches. We have new treatments. Tell us about lung cancer. All right. Not that it's good to get it, but tell, <laughs> tell us about so it. So still the number one thing is to not smoke. Smoking is the number one risk factor for getting lung cancer and quitting smoking or not smoking at all is still your biggest you know, benefit to not getting the disease. However, if you are a smoker, we now do have screening recommendations. So patients who are aged 55 to 80 who've been smoking for what we call 30 pack years. So for example, one pack per day for 30 years, two packs per day for 15 years, um, where you can make that equation and you can talk to your doctor about that. We do recommend annual low dose CT scan of the chest to check for lung cancer. And I know that was just coming of age as I uh, was getting ready to retire. Um, have we shown, we've actually shown that this reduces the ultimate death, death rate from lung cancer. Mm -hmm, absolutely, because we can catch them at an earlier stage when they have no symptoms. Right, and that's the problem with lung cancer is unlike some cancers, which will have symptoms early, or you can feel, see something like a melanoma early, Lung cancer, you may have no symptoms until it's quite advanced. Absolutely, and a lot of it is because some of the symptoms that you'd have just from smoking, such as cough or getting underlying COPD, those are the same symptoms that you would have as you were developing a lung cancer. So it's hard to tease out just from knowing how you feel. So if you're a smoker, how about if you've had an industrial exposure, uh, like asbestos? Uh, can we screen those people too? So Are they? We don't actually have a current guideline in terms of screening for those people, but I would definitely talk to your primary care doctor if you've had asbestos exposure. You should probably see a pulmonologist or a lung specialist. Mm -hmm. And depending on your symptoms and how you're feeling, they may want to do some additional testing. And asbestos plus smoking works synergistically. That, that raises your risk, not at... Not, not additively, but exponentially. So it, if you are even a lower dose smoker, but you have been exposed to asbestos, you may want to talk to your doctor about getting screened. Yes, and the other thing people don't think about also is radon. So radon exposure in your basement, for example, that can actually increase your risk of lung cancer. So and you that's should a reason have, to control the radon in your basement. Exactly, you should have your house checked and make sure that they can fix that if you have that. Yeah, and that just again, I'll speak from personal experience. We, we had radon in our old home that we discovered after having lived there for a, a 10 years. It really wasn't a big deal to fix it. I thought that they'd have to do some tremendous uh, uh, work on the cellar floor, but they just stuck a tube into the cellar floor and vented it through the roof. And it was really a pretty simple, less than a day, re day repair. So that shouldn't stop people from checking the radon, exactly, especially around here. Cool. I think there's a lot of radon in, in the Connecticut area. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so moving on, that, so we have some early detection uh, strategies and we know how to reduce our risk. Uh, 
How about some of the, the new approaches to therapy? Because they're pretty amazing. Sure. Uh, again, most lung cancer from my ear didn't respond particularly well to any kind of treatment. So now, you know, you spoke a little bit about small cell versus non-small cell lung cancers. So about 20% of patients will have small cell lung cancer, and the other 80% have non-small cell lung cancer. That 80% with non-small cell have many treatment options now. So first of all, we've discovered that there are some driver mutations, so changes that have developed that actually made this cancer arise. And some of those examples are ALK or EGFR. Those, those driver mutations actually have targeted therapies that are pills that patients can take. And tell us what that means by a targeted therapy. I think you see it on TV ads. Sure. Uh, but tell us exactly, what does that mean? This really is a therapy that is, that is geared to only attack cells that have this mutation. So we tend to have less side effects as a result of it, and it tends to be more effective because it really is honing in on the cells that have, for example, the EGFR mutation, um, and it's killing only those cells. It's really, really amazing. It's, it's if the, well, we know now that cancer is maybe a combination of different factors, but many of them are driven by specific changes in DNA that change proteins. And those proteins continue to tell the cell grow, 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 grow. And we literally have something that will fit onto that driver and turn it off. Exactly. Uh, so it doesn't, as you said, you don't see the same kinds of side effects. Do you, tell us a little bit, you do, you do have to test the tumors in order to understand what the driver mutations are. What kind of tests are they doing? So some of these are, uh, so the pathologist is doing the tests and some of these are just different stains that they do on the tissue biopsy or on the surgical specimen. So they're looking for these driver proteins specifically mm -hmm. that are, uh, that they, we know if they're there, they're driving that cancer. Yep, and then they also have some genetic tests that are just for those tumor genes. So it's not testing your body for something that you've inherited. It's something that's actually testing the tumor cells to see if they have these DNA changes. So we, again, we hear about personalized medicine. This is really very much personalized based upon your specific tumor. Absolutely. Do you, do you know, going in, you don't know what the driver mutations may be. This is, so, so it's really, so tell us, what's the sequence then? So, what does um, the patient experience? These are a little bit more common in non-smokers. So in particular, we have some individuals who are of younger age, who've never smoked, and then all of a sudden they're diagnosed with this lung cancer. These are the patients that we suspected in the are this, most. This, are these more often women than men? More often women than men, yes, but yeah, we do have men who, who have these mutations as well. So we, we don't check only if you're female. We do uh, Are we seeing these more often now as you're seeing these smoking-related cancers come down finally? A little bit. Are you seeing any increase in this this group? I would say probably not. Really, they're sort of a constant. Um, while we do have less lung cancer since smoking has decreased, we still have a lot of it. There's still a lot of work to go on cutting back from those smoking-related lung cancers. So the the surgeon or the pulmonologist will get some tissue, send it to the pathologist. Will they automatically check for these driver mutations or do you have to, does somebody have to remind the pathologist to do this? It actually is institution dependent. So here we're, we have a panel now that we're working on it so that they just reflex to this automatically. It's a little bit less relevant in the early stages. So if you have a small stage one cancer that's localized and you can remove it, um, depending on what the driver mutation is, we may not recommend any additional treatment. If you have certain driver mutations, we may recommend adjuvant treatment. So after you've had it surgically resected, going on one of these pills as a preventative measure. But this is most commonly applicable in the stage four setting. So when you have distant mm -hmm. disease. Meaning uh, that it's spread to other organs. And people may not understand what adjuvant therapy is. Well, can you say a few words about that? Because we do certainly use it in breast cancer. We're using it now for colorectal cancer, in some cases with lung cancer. Um, what, what's the whole idea behind adjuvant therapy? Sure. So when you undergo surgery for cancer, we remove all of the disease that we can see. Um, and even if we find no additional disease at the edge of the tumor when the pathologist looks under the microscope, we do expect that there are small amounts of microscopic cells that, are, that have the cancer that are floating around in your body. And these can spread in the lymph nodes or in the blood. And then those are the cells that are typically responsible for the disease that you get years or months later, um, where you find it in another part of your body and then are told that you have metastatic disease. So the goal of adjuvant treatment is to put you on a medicine that prevents those cells from multiplying and growing and actually is killing those microscopic cells that we can't detect anyway. And I think this was first done with breast cancer where we knew that if someone had breast cancer with lymph node involvement, 
uh, on the, on the, uh, in the armpit, that those patients were at high risk for having microscopic deposits of cells elsewhere. Yeah. Well, it's not that the, a new cancer develops, it's really that these microscopic cells that nobody can see uh, show up and so they set up housekeeping somewhere in your body and they grow and that's what a disease recurrence is. Mm -hmm. So we, we can't see these cells when they're single. So, well, we could see them, if we could know where to look, we could see them, but we can't mm -hmm. check the whole body for single cells. Exactly, and you wouldn't see them on an image. So that's, I think, what patients find very difficult to understand. They say, well, I've had all of these CT scans or a PET scan and there's nothing that yeah. we saw and all of a sudden I have this. Those cells were already there, it's just that there was no right. way and to I know sometimes them. surgeons will come out and say, well, we got it all, we got it. And, and you know, to the, they're, not, they're not lying. They went in there, they cut everything out that they could see. And when they left, it looked clean. Yeah. But they can't see single cells that are sitting in a lymph node nearby or sitting off in the liver. Nobody, now there are actually, uh, people have talked about circulating tumor cells. Are, are, is there any work looking at that as a way of trying to monitor a few cells, or is that more an advanced stage disease? Um, so actually, it's interesting that you bring that up. We're not really using that right now as a screening or as monitoring, but the time that it does become applicable in lung cancer is if you are looking for some of these genetic mutations, and for some reason the biopsy that you got did not have enough cells where we can do all of the staining that we want to do or all of the tests that we want to do. We now have something called a liquid biopsy where we can take just a sample of your blood and occasionally we can actually get the results just from the blood. Which is, I can't tell you how amazing that is, <laughs> but you know, what you're really finding is needles in a haystack. Right. Because you're, I mean, if you think there are, if not, there are millions of cells in a small tube of blood and you're finding a few single tumor cells, how, how do they do that? We really just draw it and then we send it off to a company that looks and extracts the DNA from the cells. Oh, so it's actually looking for, almost like we're for COVID, where they're using PCR techniques, these, this ability to amplify the DNA. Exactly, and then they look and they find the genetic mutations. We don't recommend this for everybody because it's not as good. You're not gonna have as many cells. So ideally, you would get the biopsy and you would get all of the information from that tissue. Mm -hmm. If you have not enough, then that's when you would wanna do this. But just because you don't find any of these mutations on a liquid biopsy doesn't mean that you don't have them. Do you have any patients that you can describe without gi giving anything away, but just who have had very remarkable responses to some of these new treatments. And because again, I, in my experience, it's, it's all been treat the patient, hope the tumor twitches a little bit smaller and hope you don't make the patient too sick. And it's not like that anymore. Tell, yeah. tell, tell us what this, what this new kind of therapy really means to a patient. So this can make a really big difference, um, particularly for patients who have very small brain metastases, so small amounts of disease in their brain. If they have some of these targeted mutations, I wouldn't say all of them. Um, and also for some patients who qualify for immunotherapy, some of these different treatments actually cross into the brain. And so if you have very small disease there that's not giving you any symptoms, you may not need radiation, you may not need surgery, wow. you may just get this treatment, and then we do subsequent scans and see that it's gone away. So we've actually seen metastases disappear. Correct, which is really amazing. And uh, I know that some, with some of these, you actually see the tumor almost die under your eyes. Do you see that on the x-rays? Sometimes the metastases, necrosis, the word is necrosis, yep. uh, with these kinds of treatments? Yeah, absolutely, or they just go away altogether and we, we see a completely clean scan where you can't even tell that the patient had the tumor. Now we're having, uh, we have less than a minute left and I know that some of these treatments statistically will prolong life in a subgroup of patients, prolong the life of, of patients with metastatic disease. Are you seeing patients with very prolonged disease-free life who have had metastatic disease? Yeah, we are seeing that. We, you know, Nowadays, I can tell you that we have some patients who have had lung cancer for 10 or even some 20 years, which I know you never saw 10 years yeah. ago. So some of these therapies are really good and there are new treatments coming out almost on a monthly basis at this point. So there's often something else that we can give you once you've stopped responding to that treatment. This, this is really exciting news. I think the progress in cancer, as I said, has been underreported and is underappreciated by the lay media. Uh, there really has been tremendous progress, particularly in some very difficult to treat cancers like lung cancer or melanoma and some of these others which never responded to treatment. I think it's a very exciting time. So thank you so much for sharing this with us. We have to have you come back regularly because we have to keep hearing about what it's new and further <laughs> progress, but unfortunately, that's all we have time for right now. Please, if you have questions, please email them to us at healthtalk at newvancehealth.org. 
We really want to hear from you. I also want to thank our guest today, Dr. Nicole Carew, for joining us on Health Talk and sharing her expertise. And thank you for watching. Bye-bye.